All right, that should be better. And incredibly, I mean, I, I always figured I was sort of a low level sort of a conservative, you know, you're just like, yeah, right. I mean, people should have guns if they want them, but I don't care, you know, whatever. And if somebody wants to change their gender or their sex, uh, or if they, you know, however you're supposed to say that, but everything sprinted so far to the left that all the, you know, standard conservatives became Nazis. And, uh, you know, I mean, in, in the eyes of, uh, of everybody. So everybody figures she's married to a Nazi. I mean, she had a whole career going and everything. You know, the first time I saw her, Jim, was in a place she was doing stand up and I was doing stand up. I just moved to New York and I swear to God, she was like a statue walking into the room. Like I said, six two, but just, you know, that's, that's, that's a couple inches taller than me. And I'm six feet. So, you know, I'm, wow. What is that? Who's that? You know, who's this Amazon? I've had a few six footers, you know, and, uh, this, this one was, uh, I, I, this was new, you know, something, something that large, you know, it was like, it was like Moby Dick or something. So I'm like, damn, look at that. Uh, I'm going to call Robert Shaw, you know, get him on the case. So I was, I hadn't even talked to her, Jim. I, I, I saw her. I couldn't even talk to her. She was so gorgeous. She was so just the way she didn't even look at me. She had perfect posture and just walked right by. I, and I always, I asked who the hell's that, you know? Well, what does she do? She well, she writes for the New York Post. I was like, oh, that's weird. She does stand up, yeah. So, I think I friend requested her or something on whatever we were doing then. But I don't even, I didn't, I didn't see her again for like seven years after that. I didn't see her again for seven years here in the city. And then the next time I saw her, you know, it had been some time. You know, she was getting to be closer, <clears throat> closer to forty. And I looked at her and I was like, there she is. That's that girl. I was like, I think I can fuck that girl. So <laughs> here we are. You know, I mean, like status changes, you know, for, for women different than it does men, I guess. I, uh, you know, I, hell, I never had any status to begin with. That's the thing. If you never get any status, you just never have anything to lose. And I'm not saying that's a worthy goal, but I'm saying it's it's not a bad place to end up. So, I mean, even, uh, I mean, like financially, like I'm not a rich guy, which I, I, I'm stunned that I'm sitting here in a Manhattan apartment. It doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense. No, that can't I'm be sitting cheap. here and I don't have, you know, no, not at all. And I don't have it. I don't have like a job. I haven't had a job. Like a job, I'll never, I'll never work another job. I don't care what I, I, you know, I'll do anything rather than that. It's the worst thing in life. <laughs> and if you, if you have something you love to do, and that's your job, that's great. Sometimes I think that might be the primary, I don't know if it's the primary reason I got into stand up, but I, I think it might be the primary benefit. One of them, one of the very top ones. I think it might be the best thing. You set your own hours all the time. And then, you know, when you stop working the road so much, you get that travel out of the way. Oh, I hear myself. That's weird. Uh, so the COVID comes in and then you just don't have to do anything. You know, I mean, like, it's, it's a weird life right now. It really is. There's a lot of people that are just not doing anything. And I don't know where this goes. People aren't going to want to do anything. It's like inertia. How long can you sit before you just go, fuck it? You I'll know, I mean, here. like, yeah, things have been going okay. Once you get a taste of the ass life, you, it's it's tough to go back to you know pushing a cart around or whatever the hell you do uh like I, once i was doing stand up i was i you know what i used to do was a dishwasher so the only other job i ever had was basically a job that is often taken by like ex cons and retards you know and i was like that was perfect for me you know i mean because i was that's i was among them <laughs> and, and and I've never been to jail or you know anything like that not for real 
I think my IQ, I've never had it tested, but it's been estimated around 75. <laughs> so that's I good, like, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> that's a, that's a C I think. But I, uh, I, you know, it, Washing dishes is backbreaking labor, man. I mean, they're, they're the most dishwashers are the most unappreciated people. Uh, you know, of course, that's we always think that that's you know something that we've done is the most unappreciated. I'm sure that there's somebody with a less appreciated sort of job, but that to me, the most unappreciated I ever felt, besides my first marriage, was well, and I was washing dishes at the time. So there you go, a dishwasher food off wife the plate. Ate them. Yeah, <laughs> not, not really scraping, scraping food off the plate. But then you have these breakfast plates. You know, I was always working in these diners and stuff like that. You know, and I I would short order cook a little bit. You know, then it'd be a dish wash. Have to go back and wash dishes. And the the yolk on an egg, you have no idea. How, I mean, like I don't know. Maybe you do a lot of over mediums in your home. You know, and you let them stack up for a while. But once <laughs> those things stack, sure. <laughs> And you know what they're always out of? Silverware. The waitresses are always out of silverware. And let me ask you a question. Of those two groups, retards and ex-cons, who do you think is more reliable? <laughs> retards. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Far yeah. more reliable. <laughs> they, are, they're, they, have, they have a better attitude. By far, by far. I mean, you know, like, uh, you know how it is when somebody has been to jail and you're working with them, they sort of want to know like what, how to, you know, what's the angle here and stuff like that. You know, they're trying to, I'm like, there is not an angle, man. <laughs> there is, those are the dishes, that's the silverware, you know, and then they go, oh, okay. And they, uh, they, they, you know, they're always like disappearing for a little while and then eventually they don't show up. I mean, you just look, I, uh, I don't mean to characterize all ex-convicts the same way. I mean, like, I'm sure some of them are great people. Uh, I'm sure many of them are great people. I think once you do your debt to society, you've paid your debt. That's what they asked of you, you know? But I don't know if they should be able to vote or not. I haven't, I haven't really come to a decision on that. Voting's a privilege, not a right, I think. Like driving mm -hmm. and like... Uh, you know, whatever, you could put a whole lot of things in that category, I guess. How many I, positions you know, do you think you're still fluid on, get movable on? I mean, I've kind of said, I'm a former lefty. So when I come, when I came center right, yeah, I lost a lot of my friends and stuff like that. And they all, you know, call me names and whatnot. And I realized it was just my political leaning that, that, that ruined the friendship. But I feel like my positions are more cemented than they have ever been. I feel the exact same way, Jim. And, and, I, and I look, I mean, they, there's that old saying about everybody's a liberal when they're young, and there's some truth to that because you want to talk about politics when you're 17, 18, 19, 20, in your 20s, but you don't know anything really. Uh, and that is a very easy sort of a point of view, you know, because it makes all your decisions for you. You just look for, for whatever's racist in something. And you look for whatever helps the poor people the most. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a very, very, nowadays, it's even easier than ever. They tell you exactly not only what to think, but what to say, how to behave, how you're supposed to feel. They're very prescriptive about it. You know, like we, I think, uh, if, you know, if you're in the conservative, if, if you're not with that, you might as well consider yourself conservative because they consider you a Nazi, a Klansman, a white supremacist and everything, you know, just, just because you're not that. It's not even about being conservative or voting for Trump. It's just not being 100% in alignment with, with them. A lot of them can't really see that. They think they consider what they have to be some kind of diversity of opinion or something. I don't. I, but we have the Constitution and then we have to figure it out from there. You know what I mean? Everybody can have different ideas and stuff. There's a lot, there's a, it's a much bigger tent, I think, than, than what they have. Their tent is untenable. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's untenably small and rigid and narrow and, and angry. And man, you have to wash people's feet and stuff. I mean, every single year since 2015, I've gone, man, it can't get any weirder 
than that. That was insane. And after the election, it'll calm down. That's what we all said in 2016. Boy, did it, I mean, we miscalculated. I was here in New York and they had 100,000, over 100,000 women, I guess, howling at the top of their lungs on the, on the day of the inauguration. And you, you question, you know, is this really happening? Look at this. <laughs> Excuse me. All of them wearing those ridiculous knit hats that they had on. Supposed to signify a fucking pussy. Yeah. Why would you? They told a hundred thousand women to put to put pussies on their heads and 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 howl, and that's what they did. I'm like, why are you here? I went interviewing some of them, which was insanity. I mean, it was I was taking my life in my in my hands because they can tell at a glance who you are. You know what I mean? They can tell just by the way you're looking at them. They can tell by a lot, you know, a lot of different things. You stand out. You, you're not you're not with them it's like being uh it's like trying to go undercover if you don't know anything about being undercover you know you'd, you'd probably have like the wrong shoes on and you're like oh those are shoes are not like the kind of things that those are not drug dealer shoes or whatever it is that you're trying to do and i would say why are you here why are you marching today and they would say for equality <laughs> right it's achieved there is equality and i heard an important thing i think the other day maybe it was just last night when when we stopped talking about liberty and justice and stuff like that and start talking about equality you know this, this is bad we're having a cultural revolution you and i have a chance of escaping the gulag due to our advanced age you know, it might happen after we're dead. But this is a time when I do start to go, well, it's not so bad that there's a, an expiration date here. You know what I mean? Yeah, we, I wanted to live forever before. I mean, because things were pretty, you know, of course, we take it for granted. You ever look at video during this COVID time from back in, say, I don't know, 2014 or something like that. Even 2017, people are walking around. Everybody's having fun. Nobody's thinking about any of this shit. There's a constant dark cloud hanging over everybody, and they tell us that's the new normal. And they're doing that completely uh, unjustified and unconstitutionally. They told us here in New York that we can't protest. You can't assemble and protest. It's not safe. But then Black Lives Matter does it, and they're like, that's great. Good for you guys. It's been so many, it's four centuries now. It's been millennia. Let You've been oppressed you for millions of years. Here. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. That. De Blasio. And De Blasio, what, what man. Yeah, he's he's kind of like I, I, you know, when he got elected, I didn't really have my political convictions were not especially strong. I knew this was a liberal place. I knew not to bring my gun, which I had this nice three fifty seven, kind of like a, one of those, you know, like nickel plated or you know, like silver colored at least, kind of just a big nice gun, and left that uh, with my brother, you know, because I didn't want to get involved with having it up here, and. You know, you I get caught with a gun. I'll do a couple of years. You know what I mean? It's a revolving door up here, crime-wise. But but the you know, it's it's not all enforced as quite the same way. It's not enforced uh, the same way amongst everybody. Which I guess you can never really fully expect that. You know, because judges' situations are different. But I didn't. He got elected. I thought, well, okay. Well, who did he beat? Joe Loda was the guy that ran against him. The guy from the MTA. Joe Loda was is probably a great guy, uh, a likable guy. Not a great candidate. You know, he had sort of a very uh, almost undetectable, so undetectable that I might have been dreaming it up. But I thought I heard kind of a speech impediment, and he wasn't really, uh, you know, to. Blasio's like you know seven one or something you know he's this big tall guy he's six he's I think he's six six or something and you know he looks like the mayor you know when you look at him you're like oh that looks like the mayor Anthony Weiner screwed up 
with that chick in Indiana whose name escapes me right now, which is weird. I've interviewed that woman. She, uh, Sydney Leathers. <laughs> she was the one who blew his chances. Sydney Leathers. Oof. It's just this kind of like, you know, typical, like what you'd imagine from Indiana, you know, uh, not, not supermodel thin. Looks like she had biscuits today. And I like that kind of thing, you know, because like I'm, I'm from the, the rest of the country, you know, where all the people are and not where all these, you look around New York City and the kind of people that are here electing, these, that's one thing I don't appreciate with it. Well, hey, you elected this guy, you deserve him. Come on, man, give me a break. You cannot beat a Democrat incumbent. What am I, you want me to run? I mean, what, how are we supposed to defeat that? You know, the people who elect him, they don't mind him so much. They don't care if everybody's getting shot. Shootings are up, you know, 200%. They didn't care. Nobody minds. You know, he's set up checkpoints now just by decree. So we have these checkpoints the all around the city. Wow. Armed. <sighs> Jeez. Military style. Yeah, it's 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 and they're like, afraid about Trump coming in and quelling violence in state states that are being overtaken ooh, ooh. by Black Lives Matter or Antifa. I, I didn't understand it all, and I, I thank God for Trump. I mean, I never I never thought of the man one way or another. But since he's been in, I, like I'm a ten time candidate up here, mostly for the Green Party, so I'm a recovering lefty. And I I never looked at American politics. So if nothing else, I can say, and I think Trump's done this for many people that never were political. I've been political my whole life. Just I just took the federal, provincial, and regional here in Canada, and I couldn't look. I still can't look away. I'm obsessed with it. And now I, I feel like I've grown up so much because I didn't re, I didn't see the bias of CNN. Well, maybe it wasn't there ten years ago when I used to watch it. I didn't see the you know, the 24 seven Trump commercial of just orange man bad. And I find him hilarious. I think he's the most entertaining. I love his lack of political correctness. Like, every, like, I mean, I, I like his, his leadership. I've got Justin Trudeau up here. He's a cuck for a la lack of a better term. No leadership, just written this, his, his father's name because his father was prime minister. And uh, I can't yeah. look away now. And now I'm so now I'm more educated about cages and illegal immigration and like, uh, almost all the topics that are that are huge in the states now i'm way more tuned in and educated on so that hasn't been a bad thing for me it has been for my you know how people see me and you know, i i almost weekly get the dear john letter on my facebook wall you used to be so intelligent and what happened to you well my politics changed that's all that ever happened like you're, you're so complimentary on the way out i'm intelligent i'm funny and witty what, what I'm not now, I'm just, I'm not singing from your song book. So, you know, the tolerant left is unbelievable. And you say, how do you beat a Democrat? And uh, I, I don't know how these people like the squad and the de Blasio's and, and the Cuomo's, how, how any, I mean, I guess you got liberals electing them in, in states and cities like New York city, where maybe you're allowed to get a transient uh, population. And, um, it blows my mind, but then I have to remember that, you know what, we're born this way. Like, I think there's, there's fewer people like me that go from left to right than actually are born that way with their mentality, like, you know, uh, their personality types and just stay like that forever. But it's, uh, I, I don't know where we go from here. It kind of leaves you kind of hopeless feeling, but I appreciate your humor, especially, especially like this, like I, I, I'm making, I'm making the, 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 uh, the t-shirt. And it just says, we've been duped, you know? And I feel like I've been coming around on, I think, I'm, you know, I'm seeing the light because at first I didn't really give a shit or care to even know what the hell Colin Kaepernick was kneeling for. But then when I found out that Black Lives Matter is based on a lie, and now they're a terror group. Now, now I'm bummed that so many people are taken in by the mainstream media and, you know, Trump's this because I heard nothing but sound clips from CNN. How, how do you how do you recover from a media that's completely left? The pendulum swung so far with gender and hate speech and all these things that the left says you you can't do. Cancel culture is one of the most powerful things we've seen, especially in your business. You know, so many people just gone forever, and some of them have come back. Yeah. But you know, I just feel like 
You know, and now that the George Floyd, Floyd video came out, like the body cam video, I, I think I read some of the transcript a while ago. And the transcript that I read, that, you know, and you're kind of reading it thinking, well, is this real or, you know, and it looked fine to me. And wow, now you see the body camera, uh, you know, the police body camera footage. We're, we've been fucking duped. This has been a scam since day one. And I don't, I don't think they're clever enough to have this all planned out. I think that maybe they're, they're clever enough to act on it when it's rolling like a fire and just breathe oxygen into it. But like this COVID thing and now the George Floyd thing. And yeah, equality. You're kidding, right? Show me one racist law, one racist company, one racist uh, obviously there's, there's some judges here and there or some, you know, yeah, racism happens. Nobody's trying to say life's fair all the time, but uh, you know, the, this idea that we have to burn everything to the ground and rebuild it in this, uh, this fantasy utopia of perfection. It's never, but we've always had poor. Does it like how long have the humans been on this planet? We've always had the mentally disadvantaged. Yeah. Well, like, I guess we take care of them the best we can, but like, I don't know how we recover from this. Really. I don't, I don't see the normal ever coming back. And I hate that word to the new normal, it's such bullshit. It's conditioning. And I just feel like we've been duped by the media, by big business, by a small, small minority of activists that somehow we think speak for all of us. And it's just, we forget that the bell curve, the fat part of the bell curve, where liberals and conservatives alike live and agree on stuff and just want to move forward. That's 95% of us. And these wing nuts out on the left and the right. And it's mostly the left that I see these days. I don't see the KKK rioting, you know, and causing trouble, but the, the left is as damaging, if not more. So I don't know how we recover from it, but. Well, you know, there's no recovery from this. I don't think, I, I think that, I think that it's really uh, a carefree day days of America are over, you know, and, and I think there's been transitions like this in the past, you know, so like uh, at other points, it, it just seems like there must've been not like this, not done in this way, because this is an insurgency and they have the kind of power that if they, if they're able to consolidate it after the election, you know, it's going to be, you know, somebody was pointing out, I think it was Victor Davis Hanson, Victor David Davis Hanson. He says, uh, yeah, look, uh, they're not gonna they're gonna take names they're not going to be gracious and victory you know once they have this they're going to want to squash all of their uh because that's what happens when you have a cultural revolution uh according to him you know look i mean he's a historian uh one of america's leading intellectuals i uh i tend to take him seriously yeah they used to take mentally deficient people and just you know conk them on the head with a rock and throw them in the river you know we live in humane times. Oh, we've never been People more use- tolerant. And that's what I don't get about the left. They're screaming about equality and, you know, uh, all the, oh, I don't. Let's look at the know. reasons, though. Let's look at the reasons behind it, though. You know, you have a couple of different, you, you have these, these aging uh, baby boomers who are in love with their past, the 60s. You know, and, and even if they weren't there, they were like, maybe they dovetailed, you know, like sort of right along it. And, and they, they have this sense of purpose now, you know, that they can go, wow, this is just like that. It's like, wow, we still don't have equality. And, and it's because they blow up incidents, you know, through the use of, you know, selective uh, video to make things seem as if, they're one way, you know, and, and I mean, they've out and out lied, you know, as, as Michael Brown's friend did and as, uh, and as others have, you know, that the media is expert at not telling the whole story. You know, I mean, they have a way, the New York Daily News is the best for victim porn. You know, I talk about this on New York City Crime Report all the time. They have, uh, they need a good guy and a bad guy, you know, to give the story some dramatic heft. And they'll go to great lengths to make sure that you know how to identify which one, you know, the, the one who is the victim was always merely doing something, merely, merely flicked a cigarette in their direction or something, you know, they, they, don't, they don't like any shades of gray. They don't go into victims, uh, criminal records all that much. 
um, you know, just as with Floyd, you know, who had pointed a gun at a pregnant woman's stomach, you know, and uh, pistol whipped her, and a variety of other things. He was a garbage. Yeah, he was a walking garbage can at the time of his death. It was, you know, the 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 um, autopsy that the family did was done without consideration of any toxicology uh, toxicology r- results. So. That just, that just was not part of it, you know, <laughs> but, um, uh, due to the, to the, I guess, the timely manner in which they ordered it done. You know, uh, I don't know how many, you know, because the, the thing about, about the baby boomers I was talking about is they, ide- they like to identify with this youthful part of it, too. You know, the youthful part's always going to be there, and now they're more radical than ever. You know, they, you have uh, a generation of young people who are kind of unmoored, you know, they don't get married and have jobs and have kids and and work a career, like a sort of like everything that came before, they have to like figure it out, you know, there's not those kind of jobs anymore. A lot of those jobs left between 2008 and 2016, the middle class disappeared or, you know, shrunk and, you know, didn't have the kind of representative power and, and, and a lot of people move to cities and the cities keep growing. Well, not cities, you know, just, you know, they're horrible places to be sometimes, you know, a lot of them are really dangerous. Look at, you know, geez, Chicago, even Portland. You know, it's, it's funny to me in Portland, it's, it, Portland, Oregon is like the whitest place on earth. And they're up there talking to the country about racism give me a break. You know, I mean, like you feel guilty because they think of, of, you know, they, they're seeing something different. You know, they're not, they're not, they don't see, to me it has nothing to do with race. And that's an important thing to remember. You know, none of this stuff has anything to do with race. It's driven by that. It's all about race in a sense, but in the end it's about power and the way to leverage power here in the United States of America is through race. And that's due to people's fear. Fear of being called a racist is a very, you know, obviously a really powerful fear. I think that you have these companies, then they have a financial motive not to do that. They can't be perceived as racist. So they make these quick, knee-jerk, desperate decisions based on what HR is telling. And HR is always filled with a bunch of socialists anyway. Show me one conservative person in HR anywhere. You know, I mean, like, uh, th- that's going to be a pretty uh, poorly equipped HR. Uh, you're going to get sued a lot, you know. Um, point being, though, those are powerful people, you know, and, and people in powerful positions, they do these things. Keith Ellison, you know, he's supposed to be in law enforcement. He's the attorney general. He's in law enforcement. Held on to the body cam footage in the George Floyd case until – Shit, they've been, they, they've had like two months straight of marching and rioting and looting and protesting when the rest of us are supposed to be in lockdown, withering in lockdown and, and, and watching your businesses slip away forever, you know, and, and not even allowed to go to church. I, I, if you look at the Bill of Rights, I mean, I, it's kind of tough to see... <laughs> Among the important amendments, which ones have not been violated yet? You know, you, you, you can't really speak that freely. There's people who have, have gotten in trouble with the law for calling the police. At, excuse me, after at a woman, you know, she was threatened in Central Park. And the guy said, you know, he was a black man. There was a dispute over a dog. It doesn't really matter. Point is, she's not able, you know, calling the police is dangerous now for you if you're wrong like you have to like be right about something when you used to be like they want if you see something say something remember that they want you to report it if you see something that's weird let the cops know now they're like if you let the cops know you're you're basically sentencing that black man to death the statistics don't back that narrative none of them do and and people just don't care because belief is stronger than intellect and they have a belief and if you get them started young the more time that goes by 
say you become a liberal, you're thinking liberally, you know, when you're 18. If you get to be 30, I mean, you associate that so much with your personality. I'm not a racist because this is how I feel. This is what I support. And then I think it's really tough to get that person off of that. I mean, like, I've known some people, they've come out at various points. I know one woman, I'm in comedy. She was a comedy manager and uh, she was an SJW. She still uses that term. Uh, the ideology is there. And, and so in service of that ideology, I mean, she's, she's kind of one of the people who sort of brought it into comedy. But when she saw violence coming from the left onto the right, that was what that was what turned her. You know, she couldn't. She saw the violence. She's like, there's just no justification for that, and that's that began the process. And everybody has their moment. I know another girl recently, uh, just just since COVID, she started to kind of like pay attention because, you know, she was watching the press conferences when Trump was doing those every day, which they really wised up and got him off TV real quick. His approval ratings were going up. People were believing him. We can't have people believing the fucking president. I mean, that's, it's, it's amazing how things have changed since we were kids talking about the cherry tree and uh, George Washington and Columbus and all that shit. Everybody was fine, you know? I mean, that, those days are certainly over. And now they're probably, instead of history, they're teaching like white fragility, you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, gender studies and whatnot. So uh, when she saw the difference in what Trump actually said she never even bothered to listen to him none of them do they don't listen to trump they don't even listen to him they just wait to have it described to them and then they know and you know everybody does a certain amount of that when she saw the difference in what was described on on television you know afterwards on cnn and what she read and then seeing and seeing him actually she, oh, no, it's not, that's not what he said that's not what he meant that's not what that's not what he was driving at you know uh because as conservatives, we take him seriously, but not literally. And they take him literally, but not seriously. And, uh, you know, that it, it's, it's ridiculous to see some of the things that get counted as lies in the Washington Post. You know, they have, we've added up, I think, well, they're probably up to 100,000 lies by now, you know, that he's sold because it's shit that's opinion. They, I mean, they took, they took him off Facebook and, and Twitter because he said that, like, uh, well, kids are, like, you know, geez, I mean, they're almost immune to it, you know? <laughs> Obviously, that's an exaggeration. But no, that's, that's misinformation. People might go to school if you say that. And the whole school drinking is gonna bleach, be... you're injecting yourself with bleach. And, and that's why yes. my Twitter profile says reluctant Trump fan because why – you people have made me defend this man. Like he, he doesn't need me to defend him, but you, you're just constantly right. Yeah. You are parroting back to me clips taken out of context. You know, there was great, there was uh, fine people on both sides. He, he was talking about the debate of taking down the statues. Like it had nothing. It, it, he wasn't, you know, praising the white supremacists. Like, I remember that. Unbelievable. And you're talking about in Charlottesville. Yeah. 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 He, he was did the same thing to the Proud Boys as well. They see these guys who, you know, McInnes makes a drinking club okay. that's hilarious. Happened. Their theme song is an Ala is the Aladdin Proud of Your Boy. Like it's a, it's, a, it's a joke from the beginning, from the top to the bottom. It's a complete joke, and you know, a functioning boozing club for men. And yeah, yeah. there's this stuff is serious because do you want to have press charges? Fuck you, pig. So nobody's there to press charges, but the DNC and Blasio and Cuomo or whoever it is, that these guys are doing, there's four of them doing hard time, four years hard time. And I like, you think, well, of, two, there's think of two, oh. the, the other two didn't, but there's two that are doing, that are doing. Right. Oh, okay. Years. Right. And, but yeah, but still you're right. That's ridiculous. That was a nothing thing. You know what they charge them with? Attempted assault. For the, having a work boot on or something? Attempted assault. For attempted assault because there was no I victim. It was assault with a weapon, be, and they said that their work boots were weapons. <laughs> they they could not up. have it. It couldn't be assault because there was no victim. So, therefore, uh, since there's no victim, they had to charge him with attempted assault, which has a maximum of, like, you know, they have some pretty long sentences wow. built in there, you know? Could have been seven years, nine years, maybe. I don't know. 
but like it's it's just absolutely uh i mean think about that doing hard time in jail for attempting to assault antifa when they came and vandalized the republican club the whole week before when they 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 broke the locks on the door they broke the alarm system or whatever they they broke windows they they spray painted stuff they i mean they they were they were lined up you know it on mass out there waiting for them to come out they were there for shit and you're telling me there can't be like i, I when i saw the i went to the press conference uh after that 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 cory johnson you know was running i guess cory johnson's the speaker of the city council here and and you know he doesn't know his ass you know from his belly button and he's uh he's just a moron he's just he's just a gay moron you know not that none, none, none you know those things are mutually separate <laughs> there's nothing there's no connection between him being gay and a moron <laughs> you have a lot of gay people real smart now. But he is a gay moron <laughs> yeah exactly exactly even why well, i hate to be taken out of context <laughs> uh, uh, the thing is though man i don't even know why i bother because if they want me they can at any time they're going to be able to find plenty you know, it, I, I would be the most easy person. You know, the thing is, if you, and I think if you go that way from the beginning, you just have to not pretend to be an upstanding citizen at any point. You should, everybody should at least once a day say something that is just completely cancelable, you know, <laughs> something that is just, it can get you totally in trouble. You know, I mean something really bad, like, I'm not so sure COVID's all that serious of an illness. <laughs> something yeah. really you know, Outrageous. maybe kids should go to school. Radical. Yeah. Really yeah, outside the bounds of, yeah. Shit Girls like can't that, become you know? boys. Yeah. There's yeah. two genders. Oh, oh my <laughs> fucking God. <laughs> White supremacy does not rule everything. <laughs> okay, that's it. I mean, they, their, their philosophy is that white supremacy rules everything. And, I, and, and the people who, who jump onto it from the center who don't really quite believe it, but they're just chicken shit. Those are some of the people that I, that I like the least. And it's also the people who don't, you know why you lose friends? It's not because you're a white supremacist. It's because that by losing you, that makes them better. I and mean, what's the point of being them if they can't be better? So they that's, have to uh, be the that's ones That's why you get the Dear John letters on the way out. And it's like, oh, you used I'm to be I'm breaking so up with you. Because you're a piece yeah, of they, shit. They, they, and could I'm just, they, they could just avoid the avoid your Facebook page, right? They could or just unfriend not me. You. I'll never even know. <laughs> like never even know. But that's not good enough. They, they want it in public. Everybody everybody knows, and they they're look scared shitless. Or yeah, look at me. And and not only that, but they it's again it's such an easy easy ideology just day to day. And and they know that they can't really like have a full conversation about it. Because they think that our information is just like crazy person information. You know, that's how they react to it. It's like, no, this is all there. It's like, this is printed in major, sort of everywhere. You just have to assemble it, you know? Like, we get, we get our news like a kit, you know? Like, you have to go, okay, well, what did they, oh, they left that out. Okay, so this one has that. And, and you, you really do have some assembly required. Them, you know, they glance at a headline. They sort of get the gist around the water cooler, what everybody's saying, talking about today. Hey, Trump, Trump just went right back into talking about the Dow right after someone got shot right outside. What do you want him to do? Go fucking ride in the ambulance to the hospital with him or something? I mean, let's get real. He's the fucking president, you know? I mean, there's shootings in D.C. And it goes back, you know, so far. There's so much. We have to pay some close attention, you and I do. We really do. They don't have to pay any attention. We have to study. And we don't mind it because it's fascinating. It mm -hmm. really is. When you start looking into Seth Rich and you go, Pizzagate, something's weird about that. You know, I don't know what. I don't you know. Call, labeling stuff conspiracy theories. You know, that only became a bad thing when it seemed like a lot of them were turning out to be right. You know, that's when it became this like, man, do not conspiracy theories, violent hate. You know, uh, Tim Cook, the guy who runs Apple or whatever, is garbage. And, and the language he speaks is 
is from Satan. You know what I mean? And and, and they've made their money. You know, they they they're going to be fine. They're just trying to steer everybody in a direction. These businesses who who go along with all this uh, BLM stuff, you know, I, I don't mean people just desperately trying to save their front windows and stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, but there's a major corporations some point, and sporting organizations that are just virtue signaling and glomming on and look at us. We're like, God. Well, I mean, I, I hear the NHL isn't kneeling, but I think they're mostly Canadian. I don't think we're kneelers <laughs> so much. Or maybe we just don't. Weird, feel, right? Yeah, we don't feel the oppression of racism as much, or, or I don't know. Or, I don't yeah. know. Victim uh, status maybe. isn't isn't the th- well, thing that's right up there, but you know. And then this one guy comes out and kneels, and and somebody said on Twitter the other day, ha, "Look at you! You're out in first round, you piece of garbage, <laughs> you race baiter." Oh God, the kneeling thing is just so. It's it's it. W- would be humiliating if, if, it, if it didn't just like and uh, immediately identify the person doing it. It's just like uh, some sort of a, I mean, you have to be a moral coward. You have to be. To bend the knee to, to an ideology like that because it is the ideology. I mean, like, this has really, I mean, I know they're swept up and if you make something about race, it justifies almost anything you do because they are being killed once you accept that premise they are being killed they are being randomly hunted and killed think about that think think about that that idea that the nypd which is majority minority only how how many hundreds of years do you have to go back so i'm sure that still happens in some part of the world but in north america how many hundreds africa or decades do you have to go back to like be in a place where actually people were being hunted. <laughs> Crazy. Christ hunted. Like, I mean, you got to go at least to the, I'd say maybe in the, I, let me say this, you know, lynchings were always done by Democrats. They opposed the lynch anti lynching measures all along. And they opposed the civil rights bill. I mean, they, all, a lot of these things had to be voted in in spite of Democrats. You know, it was like uh, Dinesh D'Souza, when, the way he talks about it is interesting. No Republican ever owned a slave, he says. It's very difficult to find any Republican who had anything to do with slavery. Um, and they talk about a big switch, but that's just like, yeah, that's cheating to, to even say that. Everybody just changed. <laughs> Give me a break, man. You know, they are, when people talk about institutional racism, they're not wrong. There is institutional racism. They just don't know where to look and where to look. If you want to see where people started having difficulties, where more mothers were single, where more kids became criminals, where more kids were going hungry, where education started to suck. It's all centered around when they started the welfare state back in the mid sixties. And that's where you completely. can just see it. Just you don't get benefits unless white you're people single. and black people alike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They would yeah. knock on the door and say, we got $1,200 a month for you. If, you if you're it. not married. <laughs> and that's, I mean, you know what, but that keeps going back to the, I think the root of most of our problems today is fatherlessness, especially in the black community. But you know, there's a, there's a, you know, it's a big white community too, that's on welfare. And uh, I bet you there's not too many fathers in those homes either. So either way, either color, the, it's you know, the father's either color the father doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're talking about institutional the racism, the then talk to, talk to me about the laws they brought in in the States in the sixties for welfare. Just that's to get your it. benefits. That's, yeah. That's the institutional, they, 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 you know, sometimes they understand it as the new plantation or whatever. Although, you know, with the, the work is considerably easier, I think now, uh, than, than it was on the plantation. That was pretty hard. That, that had to suck, you know, but they, they, the conditions for slavery, I mean, slavery is, is not something that is, uh, you know, we didn't make it up. No. We certainly didn't start. I mean, the, slavery is this huge thing, you know. Who I mean, is it, it was, that said something uh, about uh, slavery very trendy. was invented by the, st- by the Americans? Like, come on. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the Irish 
we're actually my my last name's Irish. I don't feel some some generational generational hate because of you know at one time my race, religion, ethnicity, whatever uh, was actually yeah. traded, and the whites because they burned in the fields. And they had mostly, they were mostly, mostly Catholics, the, uh, sorry, the Irish, they were less valuable than the black slaves because yeah. you, they could toll in the fields for long times. And, and, uh, and, and so not quite as outdoorsy. Yeah. You don't hear all the Irishmen going, Oh, my oppression, you know, like, but one girl came before my city councilor, my regional council, you know, talking about black lives matter and they want to defund the police and all this kind of stuff. And she was talking about a, a, gener- a multi-generational memory that she was conjuring up of being hunted. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, does this actually yeah. exist in human beings that three generations later, you remember your ancestors being hung or hunted or sold? He knows it'll slave? fly. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, that's ridiculous. What are you... It's 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 combining all kinds of pseudoscience, you know. That <laughs> not only pseudoscience, but just straight up quackery and 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 you know ESP and shit like that, and you know, uh, uh, drumming up your past lives and shit. Everybody thinks they did something important or interesting. Hardly anybody does, bitch. You know what I mean? Like everybody, if, if you were anybody in the past, it was something boring. Nobody was hunting you. Uh, th- that's the the conditions for slavery coming at, at that particular slave trade, you know these uh kings in africa or whatever they weren't even kings i mean they, they might have been some sort of kings but they're more like what we think of now as warlords and they were always fighting the other warlords and so they needed money they needed weapons they needed something of value and they had something of value you know slaves so they would they actually would conscript slaves by accusing them of a crime and just sentencing them to slavery it was a sentence slavery was you know at, at the time and as they needed more and more weapons which would come to them from i guess you know white europeans or whatever americans um uh, well you know it, it, they started uh the, the criteria expanded for what you might get sentenced to slavery for you know to say the least it, it, it was you know this was a cooperative thing amongst you know white and black people you can't really fully, I mean, it's sort of like the Swedish model of prostitution. You know, they want to blame it all on the guy. Well, hell, if the whore wasn't there, I wouldn't be buying pussy, right? I mean, you have to like, there has to be some responsibility. They're, they're not all sex trafficked. Now, in this case, you know, I mean, like, uh, so if somebody wasn't selling a slave, then you can't buy a slave. I mean, you think about drug dealers, they always want the dealers. They don't, they don't necessarily want the users. So whoever has the slave would be more equivalent to the drug user and who's selling the slave would be more equivalent to the dealer. But then a lot of times you'd just be buying them to sell them again anyway. So a lot of these guys were middlemen probably. And New York City, huge spot for the slave trade. There's no pride in being like from the North or anything like that. Where, where exactly in Canada are you? I'm on the South Shore of Lake Ontario, down the street from Niagara Falls, and across the lake from Toronto. So I'm okay, about an hour okay. from Toronto. It's uh, 30 miles across the lake, but an hour around it. And then uh, Niagara Falls is just down the street. So I'm in a place called St. Catharines, Ontario, Port Dalhousie specifically, which is right at the mouth of one of the old Welland Canals that goes up the uh, Niagara Escarpment. We've got about, what, uh, nine locks or something like that, so that the ocean vessels and lake travel shipping can get up the hill that is Niagara Falls. So, no, that's why yeah, you pretty, don't have to draw me a map. Pretty I'm not on my way. <laughs> it's pretty white community. Uh, I grew up in the North end. You know, I had one black kid in my whole school the whole time. And we were the greatest of friends and you know, that, that's fine. But you know, I didn't grow up in a culture of, you know, I look at some of my American friends and they come by their racism pretty honestly. Yeah. And I say racism, meaning you have the, the same experience over and over and over and over and over with the same people, the same ethnic group. What you're, you're not going to get some you know, preconditioned reaction to when you bump up against them. And, and, you know, I think we come from a long, you know, and this is kind of what Trump's brought out for me too, is, 
can we just start every conversation by going, you know what, I'm a little racist, just like you are, because we come from a long <laughs> lives of it. We, it's hard the best work. racism, the best racism. It's the finest racism like no one's ever seen. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? But we've come uh, a long way. It's, it's difficult to be tolerant and loving of someone that's done wrong to you or it's done wrong to you, a race of people that's done wrong over and over and over. And this idea that, you know, um, w- w- this is the best of times right now. Yeah, this they're is not the perfect. Best time. They're not perfect. We can get, we're getting better. We're more tolerant than we've ever been. But the racism that we came from, you talk about a biological memory. You know, I think there's something really inherently intolerant and racist about, you know, when we had, well, we didn't live in caves for long, but before, you know, in industrial age, whatever, when we bumped them, you know, when we lived in tribes that spoke different languages and different colors from different parts of the world, when we bumped up against yeah. each other, we did Break not have a party. That, yeah. We did not say, come on over for dinner and sex. Let's make some, some babies, you know, like, we, no, we tried to annihilate them. We tried to kill them, erase them from the planet. And so we're better than right. we ever been. But, but it wasn't out of racism. It was a, no, it's that was survival. just a cry for survival. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. But I think and, to and a certain degree, that's is a re- in us still, right? Not a, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I think that we can accept that a certain amount of racism is always going to be in the world. It's, it's like yeah, saying no, for well, sure. you can't get rid of hate. Right. You can't get rid of adultery. Poverty. Sin is sin. You know, bad thoughts are bad thoughts. All that stuff, you know, but what we can do is minimize all the talking about it because it, because that's really where it goes south. I mean, I don't talk about like polite conversations, you know. I do a show every Thursday with uh, Tlaib Starks at Compound Media called Safe Space, and, and it's a safe space for commentary, not from commentary. It's his show. He just lets me hang out. And you know something? Uh, it, it never comes up. You know what I mean? Like I, the last thing I ever want to get into is that discussion. I just want to get to know who I'm talking to as a person. And yeah, I, I don't talk about race in my stand up at all. I stopped it in like 2013, maybe because I think, you know what? Um, it's, it's not worth it. You know, you, mm-hmm. re- you you're going to offend someone. And I noticed how, how different the reactions were from audiences after that. You know, there was no reservation about me whatsoever. None. You know, the jokes I had were all innocuous. You know, they might have sounded edgy, but they, they, there was nothing there. You know, uh, race is not really, it's not really something I need to be talking about. I was just going to make a punchline out of it anyway. I can make a punchline out of all kinds of shit. And I, I think that talking about it all the time, worrying about it all the time is it, like a, is like a big problem and also the way it's present the media look the whole thing is whipped up there was no racial tension to speak of at various points i mean i can remember when it was it, i don't know it just seemed like it was just kind of cool you could say what you wanted everybody said what they wanted everybody accepted that we are who we are uh and um they that just they sort of started exploiting any kind of a little thread that they could get Excuse me. I think um, it's it's fascinating though the way the way Democrats are so racist that they will tell all the black people that George Floyd is you, you know, a criminal. That you're all criminals, and this is how they treat black people because this is how they've treated some black criminals. Uh, I don't think that that's true. I just don't, I do not believe that to be true. And I think that it's incredibly destructive for that whole community to have, to have, you know, th- this whole political party and this whole ideology that's telling you, like, this is the way they treat you. No, this is the way they treat some kind of piece of garbage. You know what I mean? So, somebody who uh, has been arrested 40 times, you know, somebody like, I'm, uh, go talk to black people, you know, they've never been arrested. Tons of them. Tons. Of, I mean, like they—they you know, they have never been arrested. The vast majority of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you don't hear that anymore. You don't hear that anymore at all. It's all this, like, you know, you are uh, hunted by virtue of your skin color, and that's, you know, look. Like I said, it, it's a minority majority, which I don't—I don't know exactly how. That, I mean, that's a weird contradiction in terms, 
in the NYPD. So when they start talking about the NYPD, you're talking about a large number of women. We're 30,000 officers. A lot of them are black. A lot of them are, are Latino. And, and really, you know, between people of color and black people, white people, you know, there's fewer of them because now it's oppressor, oppressee. And the only, but the only one who's really a, an oppressor 100% of the time is a, a straight white guy. So that's who they go after. That's that's what that's what they do best. And that's and that's I mean, like, look, if people don't figure it out and start to realize that like, no, there's something at stake here. When I talk to people now and they say, Well, I mean, like one side says one thing and one side says another. I mean, how can you ever really I'm like no 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 <laughs> you understand? Do you want to 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 be told to sit in your house and wear a mask forever? Uh, or would you like to have some kind of freedom about the way you live your life? You know, like it has been all the rest of the fucking time. And the decision's clear then, you know, that there's, there's something, but it's so, they, they can't, people that are stuck in that middle, that middle no man's land and, and really go, well, I think they're just both full of shit. I know that made sense back when it was Dukakis and Bush. You know what I mean? Back in the day it probably made sense when it but it it it's not like that anymore you know there's a good guy and a bad guy now and if you're not if you're not willing to wear the black hat and ride it all the way down you better get out of that one because they're going to eat you sooner or later mm, amen Pat, appreciate your time, man. Uh, just on the way out, how can people find you? Where's your shows at? And um, why should uh, when I... we, Wait, wait, Jim. When do we? When, when do, do we start, start recording? I mean, are we gonna? <laughs> You're just are we gonna... <laughs> this isn't for public com- consumption. What this uh, is? Why this is I the give, show. Yeah. Why should I give Compound Media any money? Gavin McInnes got my first subscription. The first time yeah. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna pay for something. I find him wildly hilarious i just love his he's great i i, I love everything about the man and uh, you know i've become a pretty a pretty regular caller on his show and he's helped me really hone some good comedy bits i'm no stand-up guy but I, i'm funny and I, i'm a little bit uh, of a storyteller so he's really helped me there but so the 10 bucks a month i find you know it doesn't hurt at all because he just entertains me quite a lot and you know yeah, I, money crowd, well spent yeah, Crowder helped me on my on my red pilling journey uh, quite a bit. Even listening to Shapiro a little bit here and there. I'm not such a, you know, Tim Pool is kind of where I get a lot of my stuff now. But you only got to listen to about a minute of Tim Pool stuff to get the whole drift of his 20 minute video. But uh, tell me a little bit about so the true. talent He's that's repeat on. He's going to himself the whole time. Yeah, it's, a, it's very. I difficult. love it. It's a difficult situation. Uh, but yeah, tell yeah, me. About, a, yeah, look, you know what? You know what, man? I don't know. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you Milk can, toast, uh, fence well, sitter, but I, you guys got a, quite the lineup. I'm not all that familiar with Kumia, but I, I have seen some of his stuff. But uh, and then you, I thought you were TB to uh, be TBA. Was you got a show called TBA on Tuesday at noon? You did something, T- didn't you? TB TBD Mondays at twelve. TBD TB. Okay, you're so close on any of those packs, but like. <laughs> it's, it's myself and Garrett Andrews, and that show is really getting to be fun. We, we, okay, we talk about uh, whatever comes to mind, and but we you know we plan it out to some degree. We do a top six list, uh, you know, and it'll, it'll be something like uh, anything is interesting when you look into it. You know what I mean? The history of the apple is interesting when you look into it. Now, we don't I'm not saying we spend every episode talking about the history of the apple, but you know, it's just like a randomized show. Crime Report is a show that I do at 7.30s, uh, 7.30s on Thursday uh, every single week. That's a show that I've been doing on an audio podcast now for, wow, since 2011. So that's yours? That's independent and as that, far as broadcasting goes? That's independent. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't okay. give that up. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, you know, people can, can find that on iTunes and they can find it at crimereport.nyc. I've got some great, you know, some fun merch and stuff. But lately, I don't know what it is. I've been getting lucky with some interviews. And I've, I've got Michael O'Keefe, who is the guy who shot the drug dealer that kicked off the Washington Heights riots of 1992. Very interesting guy. 
uh, and I've got another retired cop the week before him. So in the next two weeks, I'm talking to a couple of NYPD heavyweights. And if you, if you like uh, hearing, you know, cops talk about being cops, what it's like, what it was like, and compare and contrast, you know, Ralph Friedman has been a frequent guest. He's the most decorated uh, NYPD detective of all time uh, in, in, in the NYPD. And, uh, you know, his book, Street Warrior, you know, he's talking about being in the Fort Apache, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And just, it's like you had to have a machete and just chop through this jungle of crime and filth. You know, he made like hundreds of off-duty arrests. You know I mean? Like it was always, it was, it was a really hard time. We could be going back to it, but New York City Crime Report, that's, that's my, my main show. And, and it is, you know, becoming a lot more and has become a lot more cop-centric over the years. Uh, cop friendly, I should say. Look, I don't, I don't like to be political with everything. A lot of times I'm just covering crimes, but crime, I mean, let's face it, they've politicized everything, you know, they, they try to take the fun out of everything by making you make a political decision about everything all mm -hmm. the time. So look, I, I consider my point of view to be common sense and, and, and reality and, and like, let's not pretend to be offended by shit we're not offended by. Uh, people talk about these stories about people throwing their babies off the roofs and shit like that. Uh, you know, you, you make a little joke about that at the water cooler. It's fine, you know, but like, uh, you know, people, people like true crime, but they like it like Nancy Grace style. Like, can you believe what she, can you believe what he did to her? You know, that kind of shit. This is jokes, you know, you this do is a, a very light look. It's Nancy good Grace. Nancy Grace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a little well, bit we're there, from man. Similar, You're pretty we good. Have similar backgrounds. <laughs> No, uh, there you no. Go. but uh, and Jim, I appreciate the opportunity to sit here and just talk your fucking ear off. What mm -hmm. am I going to do next week when you're not Good around? Time. Good times, man. I'm always around. Always got time for you, my brother. This is like a therapy um, session for God's yeah. sake. Also, Thank you so uh, much. Like, yeah, it's my pleasure. I appreciate it. Um, who, who's your homies? Who do you still hang around with that hasn't completely abandoned you yet? I guess, I guess you're friendly with, uh, uh, Gavin so McKinnis still, but uh, how, and what about the cultural yeah. misappropriation of your name by uh, Ryan Katsu Rivera? What's this whole shit, Asian Pat Dixon? That's offensive even to a white guy like me. What the fuck? Well, I, I dubbed him that. <laughs> <What did you? laughs> because, well, the way I found, look, he, that, that guy is one of the most talented and likable people. I mean, like, there's, there's nothing holding that guy back. He has, uh, I mean, he's even a perfect, he's got a crazy ethnic mix, half Puerto Rican, half Japanese. So, I mean, like, he can make jokes about all kinds of shit. Uh, he's into sneakers, you know, so he's kind of got that, that urban Well, the thing. sneaker salesman. But I, 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 I didn't ever see enough of the sneaker salesman on Gavin's show. Brilliant. <laughs> ridiculous. So he, uh, so Ryan, the way, he was nobody. He was living upstate. And he, uh, he tweeted, so he was a fan of Compound. He's been a big fan of Anthony Cumia for years and years and years. Big fan of ONA and all that stuff. And those guys are, I mean, look, Anthony is about the funniest guy I've ever met uh, and, uh, and, and ever watched. He's, he's just, a, he's a legend, you know what I mean? So you just watch him, like, it's, he's, and he's a fun hang and, and a great boss. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry to go into so much detail about this. Ryan tweeted an impression of me. He was doing an impression of me. And I said, you, wanted to, you should come and do that on the show. <coughs> well, he did. He never left. Oh. And, uh, you know, he just kept hanging around. And then I'll tell you, I'll tell you about, the, you know where the appropriation comes in? Gavin McKinnis. All of a sudden, he's on Gavin's show doing Asian Gavin. I'm like, oh, hold on a second, Gavin. Classic. Kind of my bit. Kind of my bit. <laughs> I... Find the guy, bring him in. You steal my fucking, you stole my Jap. You know what I mean? <laughs> you stole my, can't do that. You know, Ryan's a good friend and, and like, he's a, he, he's one of the best friends I have on this earth and, and, and so talented. And uh, I mean, like, it sounds weird to say it when a guy's in his thirties, he's got a big bright future ahead of him, but I, I mean, shit, I think he could, he can still do anything he wants. That's I told sure. him the other day via uh, DM, I'm just like, dude, your, your comedic timing is just, just unsurpassed lately just his reactions you know gavin sets him up pretty well I, I don't know what he did the other day he was just looking down and he was pretending it was just it, it was beautiful but he's really he's really come into his own there i was a, I, I was a little worried you know well i think some of it's got to be some of it being an act as far as the 
the um, like Gavin yells at him. Yeah, the abusive nature of Gavin's uh, way with them, and and uh, you know, one time he, yeah, I don't know, he, he went after him, and and he's like, yeah, that'd be the last day, you know. And then they were kind of, oh yeah, oh yeah, and I'm like, oh god, it was so cringe, but uh, he's really coming. The impressions are unbelievable, and his timing has really come down. But I don't have to be worried about him, right? He's not in a bad place with Gavin beating on him all the time. No, 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 no. He's <laughs> he's not going anywhere. Because I was if saying anything, at first, because, right. yeah, when he was when he was when they were, you know, I'm like, oh, this this looks like the narcissistic personality, you know, the guy that it's never his fault type of thing. And then I'm waiting, one of my friends that I met through Gavin. Uh, the, the show anyway said you know if anyone's a narcissistic personality type it's it's gavin he's gaslighting that kid all the time and so i've had a shift on him but he's really you know, when you're when you're hosting but when you're hosting a show i can say as you know you know you host a show now you're canadian and he's canadian but he's come down here and sort of absorbed a lot of fucking shittiness i think maybe <laughs> gavin has i don't know he's like knocked a little bit of that canada off of him yeah. and he's like yeah he, he'll yell at somebody for nothing and uh when you're hosting a show, sometimes you, it's just the best thing to do. You can't be, you know, Gavin is very smart and he doesn't want to look ineffectual. Like, do you have that? Well, uh, and so they're like, you, so you have to yell. He did the same thing with, with Ben. You remember Ben Ratner? Before he, my time. Ben Ratner was, was so bad. He's, yeah, that's why he started Proud Boys. Because Ben Ratner was a virgin. And he would go see, he was into Aladdin and shit. That's where that whole thing came from. He built it up. I watched it happen. This it is a producer crazy. at Compound? He was in the booth. He, you know, he, yeah. I mean, I got, oh, okay. you could call, I don't, producer is a strong word for it. You know I mean? Like he was the one pointing the camera. He was more of like a, more of a, uh, what you call a, a director, I guess, you know, like, uh, but but the guy was a virgin in his 20s, didn't have any desire to lose his virginity, had no shame about it, and was and it was like, wow, that's weird. You know? and, and Gavin was horrified by it, and he started seeing the need to create something for guys to like, you know, you have to act like men at some point, you know? Stop jerking. That's where it's no wanks, you know what I mean? Like, don't be jerking off. He wants people to go out and, you know, get married, get pregnant, have babies, you know, have lives and shit, you know, like, like they used to do in America. And uh, that's really, you know, you, you can't be going around talking about how great Western civilization is anymore. You know what I mean? I would have thought that was a fine thing to talk about, but that's just a, that's a no, no at, at this point. Uh, so at long story short, a lot of good stuff on compound as well. You know, there's like, I'm on three separate shows. Oh, really? Plus there's What's the other one? Yeah. The other one's Safe Space. So Safe, safe space, space, Crime Report, and TBD. Yeah. Oh, so and, you and still do I'm Crime Report through co space. Compound, eh? Exactly. Oh, and I, okay, and okay. I sort of like generalized it a little bit there for a while. So like I can cover crime anywhere. And I can also, like, I can just take a free hand there. I mean, nobody ever tells me what not to do or say. I mean, we used to have porn girls come in there and stuff for a while. But then they were, all they wanted to send me was, uh, you know, chicks with dicks, right? And like, fine if you want to be that just doesn't personally get me excited and that's the whole point of having him on is to have a topless woman a few feet away from you it's a, uh like I, i'm a small man jim you know that um is, by now i uh yeah gavin gavin was a big part of my uh, uh uh political development too i heard him on that show that he used to do at stand-up labs you know that uh freedom of speech and I was like, wow, listen to how plain spoken he is about this shit. That's weird. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of started along this path. Uh, we're almost exactly the same age. We're to the month the same age. But you look at that guy and you're like, man, what, what makes a guy look like that? Got some <laughs> so, miles on him, eh? That odometer's turned yeah. over a couple of times. Hard life, man. He's but, in better uh, shape physically, though. Yeah. Jim, I know you got to go. I I'm extending it too long. Has it been <laughs> an hour and a half? I'm, I'm very sorry. I appreciate. No, I put the hour and a half up there. Time. Usually, an hour. Thanks for being a guest on my show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm looking to come back when you uh, hit the big time. Thank you, brother. Uh, so how do people get a hold of you? Where can they find you and give you some love? Oh yeah, I think the uh, easiest of all, just look for New York City Crime Report, and and you can find that at crimereport.nyc. The newest episode will always be there. And, and you can also look at the other stuff there too, crimereport.nyc. I'd be most happy to have people do that. And also subscribe to Compound Media, look into it anyway. 
uh, great. Uh, I mean, like it, it's a kind of commentary. It's all, you get a lot of live entertainment, you know? Uh, I mean, I was on a show last night called the wet spot, which I hadn't been on yet. <laughs> it's hosted by this like you know, pretty girl. And, uh, and she has a lot of pretty girls on and stuff. So there's like a, there's a variety of shit is what I'm saying. A lot of programming and it's, and it's really not very much money. It's less than what Gavin gets, I think. And, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's something about live entertainment, isn't there? It's smart yeah, that you sure. do this live because mm-hmm. there's just something about, about things happening live and it, and it looks great. And I, I can't say enough good things about it. Check out compound media and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, you sold me. I'm going to check it out, and uh, that'll be my second. Um, you know, Crowder's great. I'm sure he's got a lot of content, and it's highly produced and stuff like that, but I, I kind of feel like I need a little bit more variety, and the live aspect is great, too. I know Crowder does a lot of stuff live behind the paywall, but uh, I was looking at the website today. I didn't check out how much it was, so I'm glad you said that as far as how much. I mean, it sounds like 10 bucks USD is the standard rate if you want to be behind anyone's paywall, but it, it looks interesting. I'm a a fan of Kumia's. He, I find him interesting. I don't know him that well, but uh, I've seen enough of his stuff to appreciate um, that, you know, and the compound media thing has been, it's been going on for a long time, you know, and so they've been supporting free speech and, and uh, this, you know, against censorship for a long time, I, I can imagine that. But uh, anyways, Pat, I love you, brother. My show is the longest, good. longest continually running show, crime report. So yeah. Yeah. We're- you're the flagship, the flagship. and same to yeah, you man I, as, as gavin would say i like you more than a friend <laughs> i like you more than a friend all right brother we'll talk soon i appreciate the time thank you very much pat dixon if thank you need him everyone thank you jim have a good one later brother thanks see you man peace